Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. So are we, um, so everyone who's speaking is going to stay where they are with change? Mm -hmm. Um, no, everyone's gonna. We're gonna sit here. We're gonna rotate. Speakers gonna move. Yeah. Okay. Right. Definitely the right password. Safi, is your laptop charged? It is charged. Can I send my notes to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just uh, do you want to go through? The you can use it here, by the way. Oh, yeah, actually, no, no. You can use it here. I just pull it up on my computer. So. Yeah, so that's yeah. what I do is I. Yeah. The streamer won't go out. Yeah, that's not a problem. I just do side by side okay. usually. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Shall we get started? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everybody. Welcome to our temporary indoor space for now, alhamdulillah. Uh, everyone's first time here, probably, right? I don't know if you've ever been to this location or around this area before, but uh, we're really first and foremost happy that um, we see everybody who can see your emotions through your masks. We're pretty good at that after seven, eight months now, alhamdulillah. Uh, and uh, we're honestly, you know, very blessed to be able to do something like this. We're really fortunate to be able to host this consistently now. You know, we started with Monday night here uh, this past Monday and kind of transitioning soul food here indoors now that the weather is going to be starting to transition into a little bit of a colder uh, climate. Um, so I'm really happy that you're here. So this place right now, by the way, uh, was graciously offered by one of our community members. So before you guys leave tonight, I just want everyone to kind of just take a quick second and just make a quick dua for the person who has so amazingly offered us to use this facility uh, to, you know, reflect over Allah, reflect over the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and just kind of reflect together as, 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 as believers. And so uh, it's an amazing thing that's going on here, alhamdulillah. Uh, so tonight we actually have a really special treat. Uh, so Soul Food, we are going to be uh, doing something really cool where every week we're going to be involving a new teacher, a new instructor, a new mentor uh, to kind of guide our conversations, share reflections, uh, go through the topic and really shed some light and insight from different perspectives. Uh, and so if you all saw the, uh, the post, the post uh, for this Thursday, um, the topic for today is about how you make the right decisions. Um, which is ironic because of the week that we're in right now. I think everyone, so before we start, I need everyone to take like a giant breath. I need everyone to breathe, okay? And now breathe out. Now you're all breathing like you're saying the same air that you just emitted. <laughs> it's like that was not a nice experience at all whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, I just want everyone to take a deep breath, okay? Because this week was extremely overwhelming. How many of y'all feel that this week was extremely overwhelming in terms of your thoughts, right? I mean, me, me and Mataf right here, we're just talking, like we memorized the number 264 in our heads right now, right? Everyone's like, when? When's it gonna happen? When are they gonna get it, right? Like, when's, it, when's everything gonna be decided? You know, like it, it's very overwhelming sometimes, right? And it almost ironically leads us into our conversation about how to make decisions in our faith and what's the process of making the correct decision. There's a lot of people in here, including myself, who have gone through questioning themselves about what, when do I know when I'm doing something right or when I'm doing something wrong? Is there doing something right and doing something wrong when it comes to decision making? Is there an, an example that the Prophet ﷺ left for us? These are the questions, inshallah, that we'll be reflecting over and sharing some thoughts and wisdoms from. First and foremost, we're going to introduce uh, Usad al-Fatima, and then inshallah, after Usad al-Fatima, we're going to introduce Usad Murphy, who both will share some reflections on this topic. So Usad al-Fatima, inshallah.
Assalamu alaikum, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good, alhamdulillah. Rabbi Shrahli Sadri wa Yasuri Amri wa Hlu Lukadatam Nilisani Yafka Hukawi Rabbi Zutni Ilma Rabbi Zutni Ilma Rabbi Zutni Ilma. I was just talking to a couple of people about the topic today on decision making and how do you know that you've made the best or a good decision or what does it mean to make a bad decision? And when I was talking, um, like just kind of thinking about it, it's probably one of my very, very favorite topics, similar, si simply because of the fact that it's something that you have to go through every single day, right? So every day you have to make a decision about something. And last night I was talking to one of my friends and we've been kind of on this interesting journey. We like to go on journeys together. So we're on this interesting journey of like, you know, I want to eat healthier, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I was telling her every day I have to make a cautious decision that this is the particular way that I want to live my life. Like every day I have to wake up and say, Fatima, you are going to do this today and you're going to be like this today and you're gonna to reply to this person in this way today. So every day I live, I try, I'm trying to, that's why it's a journey, um, to live my life with a purpose and part of that purpose is choosing to do those things when I wake up every single morning. So decision-making is something that is a part of our everyday life. There are some decisions that are big, you know, they're, they weigh heavy, they have very big, you would say, consequences to, did I make the best decision, did I make the wrong decision? And there are some decisions that are so tiny, you don't even think about them. You know, there are things that you just kind of automatically do every single day. We know that the Prophet Wasallam serves as our our prophet, he also serves us as our role model. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's uswatun hasana, that he is the perfect role model for us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had to make a lot of difficult decisions in his lifetime. And so him serving as a role model for us, going through his life story, and being able to pick out these different situations at different times in his life, that he made these decisions help us in understanding what does it mean to make good decisions and what does it mean to make bad decisions and what does it mean to, you know, what does it mean to have to go through this? So one story in particular that I truly, really enjoy in my soul is the story of the Battle of Badr, or the Battle of Uhud. I enjoy the Battle of Badr too, but the Battle of Uhud. And the Battle of Uhud, because there's so many parts to it, we're not gonna cover all of them because then we can be here for like 10 years. And I'm sure you guys are not gonna hear me talk for the next 10 years. So, but there are some good, parts that, especially when it comes to decision-making, um, that we are going to talk about when it comes to the Battle of Uhud. So you have that the Prophet um, now the, the Muslims, the believers, you know, they're finally in Medina. And Medina is like, basically, for them, it is the ability to take a deep breath and just be like, Phew, the hard part kind of over. You know what I'm saying? Not really, but it's like a good moment of, at least I have my own home, I have my own this, I have my own that, I have my own space, I have the ability to just kind of be Muslim. I can be my Muslim self, my best Muslim self. Then boom, the battle of brother happens, and the battle happens, and the Muslims win, and it puts the Muslims on a map, but part of being on a map means now you have haters. And so they have all of these people who are now like, well, we thought this was a small group of people, that we didn't have to worry about, but it seems like they have a lot of power because they won this huge battle against the Meccans. So what transpires is now the Battle of Uhud. And the Battle of Uhud comes into play where the Meccans are now like the Quraysh. They're like, you know what? We're gonna avenge the deaths of those that we lost in the Battle of Badr. And the thing about the Battle of Uhud was that some people were considered to, were taken in the Battle of Badr as prisoners of war. So those people taken as prisoners of war, obviously now they've seen the inside of Medina. They know the layout of Medina. They know how the Muslims think. They know strategy. They have all these different things that they were able to take back to Mecca. So when the Prophet ﷺ gets word that, you know what, the Meccans are on their way to fight again, as if they didn't, they weren't, as if they didn't get whooped the first time they're waiting for another whooping, basically. So the Prophet ﷺ gets word. And the very first thing that the Prophet has to decide is, are we going to fight from our homes? Or are we going to go meet them out into a different battlefield? So will we fight them from inside of Medina? Or are we going to meet them out in a different battlefield? 
So what the Prophet Sallam does is that he himself is thinking that, you know, it's probably best to like fight from inside of Medina. Mainly because they can not necessarily inside of their homes particularly, but like right on the outskirts, right there, you know, right on the border of Medina, it's probably best to fight from here. So that is what the Prophet Sallam is thinking. But the Prophet does something that is very important in our lives, and that is called shura, that you go and you con consult with other people. You just don't make decisions by yourself. You know, you go, you gather your community, you gather your friends, you gather the people you know that know you well, that know the situation, and you sit down and you have a conversation. So the Prophet has a conversation with them, with the companions, and he's giving shura, he's doing the consultation, he's asking, where should we go and fight? And what happens is that you have a group of companions that say, we should fight from inside. We should fight from inside of Medina. And these are classified as what you will say the older companions, okay? Then you have the younger companions. And these younger companions, they're not just any regular, diverse, regular younger companions. They are people who wanted to fight in the battle of Badr. But the Prophet told them, no, you're too young. If another battle comes, then maybe we'll consider it. So now they're old enough to fight. So where, where, what do they want to do? They said, we're going to get in their face. I want to meet them where they're at. We're not going to fight from inside our home. We're not going to wait for them to come to us. We're going to go to them. So they're, they're making their case, and they're not backing down in the least bit. So after everything is said and done, the Prophet says, you know what? We will go out, and we will fight them. And where we will go out and, cat, and, and meet the army is at the battle, the place of Uhud, which is like a big mountain, and we'll talk about that. So once the Prophet makes this decision, there is a guy by the name of Abdullah bin Ubayy bin Sulu, and he was later confirmed to be a hypocrite, but he was amongst the senior companions who also were amongst the opinion that we should fight from inside of Medina, okay? And then you have these younger companions. So the older companions kind of go to the younger companions and they're like, why do y'all pressure the Prophet Sallallahu to make this decision? Like, what's wrong with you? You're like yelling and screaming, tell Prophet you're gonna fight, you're gonna get in their face, you're gonna do all this, da da da. Why are you so like, you know, when older people talk to you about how you're not supposed to act like that, why are you acting like you don't got no home training, basically? So now these younger companions, they feel bad. So they go to the Prophet and they tell him, Ya Rasulullah, we feel like we pressured you into making this decision, and we're sorry. And if it's the case that you think is best for us to fight from inside of our homes, inside of Medina, we can fight from inside of Medina. And the Prophet he says something that is so beautiful at that time, that is so beautiful about, you know, when a difficult thing arises and how you deal with it. But the Prophet he says that it's not befitting for a prophet that when he has put on his armor, he should take it off, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided between him and the enemy. Meaning, we already, we already made the decision. I came, I did consultation, and from that shura, this is the decision that was made. And we're gonna go with it. We're gonna go with it. I understand that you think you're pressured me into this. No, we're gonna do this. Because at the end of the day, this is the decision that we've made as a community. And we're gonna get out there and we're gonna fight. So they go now on their way to the battlefield, to the battlefield, the place of Uhud. And when they get there, it was very interesting. It's now Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul. He decides that this is the moment when he wants to let the Prophet so know he doesn't agree. He could have sent it back at the house, but later he was confirmed to be a hypocrite. So he raises his voice to the Prophet so He talks to the Prophet so in a very disrespectful manner. And he lets him know, he's like, you following these little kids? I'm not gonna do this, I'm grown. I already know how Medina is. We could have won. We're not going to win with them fighting from outside, da, 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 this and that. So I'm taking my boys and I'm out. So he takes 300 of his men and they leave. Now, at that moment, what could have happened? At that moment, the Prophet Sallallahu could have been like, you know what? He's right. We've lost 300 men. Now we need to go back and fight from inside of Medina because we lost 300 men. Like, that's not, that's not a small number. You know what I'm saying? That's not a small number. We lost 300 of the people who are going to fight with us to help us in this battle. So the Prophet Sallallahu could have been like, you know what? I'm going to plead with you, beg with you, da da da. Please don't go. Please don't leave. No, instead the Prophet Sallallahu says, okay, see you later. But there's another thing about this particular situation. 
is that at the end of the day, the Pops of Sanam and Abdullah bin Ubaid bin Salud didn't get along on many things. Let's start with Akida first, because Abdullah bin Ubaid bin Salud was a hypocrite. He was someone who claimed belief by tongue, but did, but did not believe in his heart and in his action. That constantly throughout the history of Abdullah bin Ubaid bin Salud's Islam, he constantly acted in a complete opposite of what Islam called for him. So him and the Prophet didn't agree on many things. But you see here in this particular situation, the Prophet actually did agree with him. He did actually agree with him in fighting from the inside of Medina. Sometimes for us, we may have a decision that we wanna make, or we may be in a conundrum. I don't know if I should do this or this. I don't know if I should get this or this. I don't know if I should apply here or here, or if I should take this major or that major. And you may have an aunt or an uncle who's always talking to you and it's like really annoying and this person's always has something to say all the time. Every time they see you, they're like, well, what are you doing with your life? Aren't you going to do this? Well, why did you pursue that degree? How come, aren't you smarter than that? Da -da -da, this and that. And then you come and you're in this predicament and you want to make a decision and maybe you're leaning towards becoming like a journalist, for example. And then that same uncle comes and they're like, yeah, you should become a journalist. And you're like, no, I'm not doing that. This crazy guy is the one who's telling me to do it. Clearly this is the wrong decision. No, that's not how decision-making works. Part of shura, part of decision-making, part of these things is about humbling yourself. That you recognize that it's not only you who has the, it's not only you who's able to make the best decision. Now, sometimes you do, have, you do have to go outside of yourself to get that extra information that you need or get that extra support, to get that extra information, that extra support to be able to make the right decision. And it may come from the people you don't want it to come from. And that's where you have to look deep in yourself and say, you know what, am I being arrogant? Am I being arrogant? Am I not taking your opinion simply because of who you are and the fact that you annoy me? and you always have something to say? Or am I actually thinking about what this person said objectively? Now, if you're objectively thinking about it, and you're like, yeah, nah, straight. Okay, fine. But the moment that person opens their mouth, you're like, absolutely not. Can't believe you even tried to give me advice. Who do you think you are? That's what goes on inside. Like inside, you're like living. Oh, just because you're mad, you think you can tell me what to do? Be objective about it. Think about it. <clears throat> so you have now that the battle the battle happens, and we're not gonna go through the whole battle because again, we'll be here for a long time, especially because it's like a really good story. And so you don't you don't you don't just rush the battle and go ahead, guys. You go through every single person's like part that they played in the battle. But before the battle is about to occur, one of the biggest strengths that the Muslim Muslims had were their arch the archers. And the archers, basically, you can think of them as like assassins. I don't know if you guys ever, never mind. Um, you can think of them as like <laughs> snipers, people who are like snipers. So they basically never miss a shot, all right? So if they're shooting, it's hitting the target. And so the Prophet um, sets them on this hill and he lets them know that you are not to leave this position, okay? You do not leave this position, even if you see like dead bodies on the battlefield and you see that there's no one there. You do not leave until I come to you and I relieve you of your position. So they all agreed. It's about 60 archers. What happens now is that the entire battle occurs. And because the way the position that the archers are, say like the archers are right here, the Meccans are, are approaching this way, they're like just firing arrows at them. Just firing shots again. They're snipers. So they're shooting and they're hitting. Shooting, hitting, shooting, hitting. So the Meccans are like, oh no, we didn't, we didn't sign up for this. So they start to retreat. You know what I'm saying? They're like, we didn't sign up for this. You have another companion by the name of Abu Dujana who is known to be able to fight with both of his hands. So he had a sword in each of his hands and he would just be walking through the battlefield, like running on, on his horse through the battlefield. Everybody that was on both sides of him would be falling down. They're just all like falling like flies. So the Meccans are like, this is not the same people I don't know what kind of steroids these people are on. This is not the same people we were fighting before. We're about to go home. So they start to retreat from the battlefield and they were retreating. But what happens is that 
there's a group of basically one group of Americans who led the Holocaust elite who are on the side and they're just kind of watching everything kind of you know play out. So the Americans they all retreat from the battlefield. Once they retreat, you see that the the archers they see all right seems like battle's done, and so some of them are like, what should we do? So a group of them, ten of them say we should stay here because the Prophet said for us to stay. The rest of them say, you know what? But the battle is done. And since the battle is done, we should leave. And so they made the decision to leave. Once they left, Khalid bin Walid saw that as his opportunity to lead his cavalry from behind that hill and now approach the, the Muslims from the, defense, the, side of, uh, the defensive side. So the fact that the Muslims now, their back is basically to the battlefield. And what that means is that this is basically now a massacre meaning that the Muslims now have lost the battle. Now, when this occurs, when this happens, something very interesting transpires. And what transpires is that one, the Prophet um, he gets hurt in this time. This is the time when Hamza bin Abu Talib also, he, he also, uh, Abu Talib also passes away at this time. And then you have that so many other companions like Musa bin Umair radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he also loses his life. So there's so many things that happen and it was this decision. Now, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the Prophet a very, very, very important thing, an important thing to remember. And he says this in Surah Ali Imran. This is after the whole battle is done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, He says that, min min that it is out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are lenient to them, that the, these archers that left their posts. Imagine your mom told you, for example, when our parents tell us to take out the chicken and my mom is on the way home, my mom's visiting right now, so it's real funny. Your mom's on the way home and she's like, did you take out the chicken? How does your heart feel? It's like you, you feel like, you know what, I'd rather just go bury myself. Like, <laughs> you don't even have to do it, I'll do it for myself. You know, when your parents tell you to do something, they're very clear or your mom or your dad's like, go find this thing. And you come back and you're like, I didn't find it. They're like, if I get up and I find it, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna have one less child. And you go and you frantically search to make sure that it's there. And then they get up and they find it in the same exact place that they told you to look, but you could swear it wasn't there before. How, how does your heart feel? So you have these companions, who, they're companions. They're not strangers. They're not disbelievers. They're companions. We say so. We say, "Radiyallahu uh, anhum" um, uh, about them. May Allah be pleased with them. They're companions. They were given a direct order by the Prophet and though they perceived a situation a certain way and then made the decision to leave, they have to answer for that decision. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it's out of my mercy, out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you were lenient with them. Because if you weren't lenient with them, they would have dispersed. Like you would have shattered them. Like their hearts would have broken. Like sometimes the disappointment for your, from your parents or from someone in authority that you really admire, that you really care about, that you really love, that you really, you know, you who really look up to, that disappointment, you'd much rather they slap you than be disappointed in you. And so Allah SWT says that they would have crumbled if you, were, if you weren't lenient with them. And then Allah SWT, he, he says something afterwards. He says that the, what you should do is فَعْفُعَنْهُمْ That you should forgive them. وَاسْتَغْفِرْنَهُمْ And seek forgiveness on their behalf. Forgive them. They made a mistake. This decision wasn't the best decision. But was their decision something that only affected them? No, it affected so many other people. It affected so many other people. But Allah SWT says, was stuck for them. Seek forgiveness for them. And then Allah SWT says, was shawir hum fil alam. And integrate them back into society. Bring them back into the close circle. They made a bad decision. They made a mistake. So consult them on what should, what should we do next? 
Consult them on the matter. Consult them on what we should do next. They will come back to them for sure. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا azanta فَتَوَكَّرْ عَلَى اللَّهِ When you've made a decision, then you put your trust in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you've made a decision, when you've decided on something, فَإِذَا azanta When you've decided on something, فَتَوَكَّرْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then you put your trust in Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends off this ayah, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ that indeed Allah loves, He loves those who put their trust in Him. And we learn a lot of things from this particular situation in the life of the Prophet. We learn what it means to make good decisions, what it means to make bad decisions. And the very third thing is that sometimes we think that we're living in this world alone, and this is my life, and I can do with what, whatever I want with my life, and if Fatima makes a bad decision, then that's just on Fatima. You know, Fatima's brothers, Fatima's sister, Fatima's mom, Fatima's dad, they don't have any, anything to do with this. If I make a bad decision, it's just about me. I have to deal with the consequences. That's not true. The decisions that you make have an effect on the people who are around you. The decisions that you make have an effect on those who are around you. If you decide, you know what? I want to drive recklessly. I'm not going to wear my seatbelt. I'm speed limit is 50. I'm going to do 95. You know, it's not that bad. You decide to drive recklessly. God forbid something happens. Yeah, you have your own problems. But who else is dealing with the effects of what happened? Your mom, your dad, your siblings, your friends. I was talking to a, a, um, one of the girl, some, this one girl the other day, and we were talking about you know people and like you know friends, and she wanted to advise her friend about a certain situation. And sometimes we think that you know what, if I make this decision or I do this, then it's just my decision. And I was telling her that a lot of times social media and stuff like that, like social media, music, all these things kind of fools you, makes you think like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm independent, this is an individualistic society, whatever the case may be. And so it makes you feel like things like trapping and all that stuff is like fun and cool and cute, right? But when somebody gets shot, who calls the parents? Your friend. The friend has to go and sit with your mom and let her know that you were doing something that you shouldn't have been doing and you got caught up in crossfire. Now who's affected there? Everybody. So when you're making a decision to do something, don't just think about yourself in that time. Also think about how it affects those around you. And the last thing is that if you make a decision that's not so great, it's a bad decision, objectively, that doesn't make you a bad person. Just make sure a person that made a very bad decision. Because these companions, they weren't bad people. They just made a bad decision. And that's why Allah SWT says, forgive them, seek forgiveness on their behalf, and let them know, listen, we still brothers, we still cool. Yes, this was a big mistake, but it's okay. We're still cool. We can still have conversations. We can still talk about important things. Because at the end of the day, we're all human. And so Allah SWT says, uh, when, when you make a decision, put your trust in Allah. Are you, going to put, are you going to try to make a bad decision in that case then? You're like, oh, Allah, please help me make this bad decision. No. Then you're going to start to think more objectively and better about the decision that you're making. So these are the things that I wanted to share today, inshallah. Ustad Abdurrahman, he's going to come in and he's going to share about how do we go about making, how do we know that we made the, the right decision or how do we go about making good decisions, inshallah. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdika, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nasakfiruka wa natubu ilaha. As-salamu alaykum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Did you guys see the tweet where it said that like, when you take off your mask after you leave a store, you act like a surgeon who just did a 12 hour surgery. Just like ripped off your face, that's what I felt like right now. Um, so Jazakallah khairan to Ustad Fatima. You know, this topic is a topic that 
it never ages. It never gets old. It's something that I'm 32. I know that there's people here in the what's it, okay in the college audience. I'm 32 years old. This is something that we have to think about constantly, and this is something that some great scholars in our tradition they even mentioned themselves that when they were passing away on their deathbed, you know, they thought about this moment or these moments that they regretted, right? Making bad choices. Uh, it does something very interesting to you. It kind of simmers within a person. And that simmering, it eventually causes a person to feel a certain kind of weight or heaviness that in the beginning, maybe they can ignore, but once there's a substantial amount, it's, it's unignorable. And so the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and we learned this in Surah Al-Mulk and other chapters in the Quran, is that life is quite literally, if you want to think about like what is life, this existential question that people ask or struggle with, the Quran answers this question for us really clearly. لِنَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life and death. Why are we here? Why are we on this earth? Why during a pandemic, during this, during that? This question's probably been brought to a lot of people's minds this year with all of the strange happenings. Why? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that very clearly, that you're here for one reason. And that is to see how you handle things, to test how you handle things, to test whether or not your faith will be able to inform your decision making. In moments where you simulated in your head one way that you would act, but now you're there, right? And that's the crazy part is that your intellect, we've become so intellectually confident that we think that we know exactly how we'll respond, but then when the moment occurs, we have a completely different response. Anyone ever had that before? Like you, you, you completely believe that you would answer a certain way, but then you answer a different way. And they're not always in like crazy moments. Sometimes it's in like, you know, uh, if, a friend, if you got into an argument with somebody, you know, and you heard a story about how somebody lost their temper and in your head you're saying, I, I would never do that. I would never do that. That's your aql, that's your intellect. That's your, your mind is now pre presenting this answer. But the other part of you, right? There's three that we're gonna talk about tonight. One of the other parts of you, your nafs, when the, when, when the moment happens, when you're there, it takes over, it takes over the steering wheel and it makes that decision for you, right? And Ibn Qudama and some other scholars, they said that like the nafs is like a trained animal. That's why all year long we act a certain way and we blame it on shaitan and Ramadan comes and the hadith says that shaitan is locked up, but we still make some of the same mistakes. We still make some of the same mistakes. The scholar said, how do you know whether or not your decision is a shaitanic whisper, right? the one who whispers into the chests of humans or whether you know it's like a nefsical thing, like something that's built inside of you. And they said, if it's something really fleeting, like a really fleeting idea just kind of comes and goes and you're kind of like, that was weird. And you kind of get back to your senses quickly. They say, that's probably a whisper of shaitan. But they said, if it's something that you struggle with, that you're battling, that's like, it's like a, it's like a debate. It's like the first presidential debate. It's ugly, right? You against yourself. They say that's probably from your nafs. And it's been trained. It knows where things are. Our cat, recently we changed the location of our cat's food. Still, I mean, we're not playing games. We did it for a proper reason. Right? You guys are like, you're torturing your animal. That's not nice. No, no. We just moved it because the kids kept knocking it over. So the next morning, we put the food there. It's all in the same area, guys. It's all in the kitchen. Okay, and cats aren't stupid. My cat walks over, looks at the food bowl, and then looks at where it used to be and goes and plops his like 32 pound body onto the area where the food used to be. And I have a picture of it. I'll put it up on Instagram tonight, just for you. Of literally, I'm not joking, the food, Safi's seen it, he knows my brother-in-law, he's been. The, the, the food next to an area, it's all within sight. And the cat plopped over, right? Just like Jabba the Hutt, just right there in our kitchen. Do you guys watch Star Wars? Okay. That was a really good joke. You missed it. I have a really fat cat. Job of that. Okay. I just took that a little personally. So, so he's just plopped there and he's refusing to go eat. He's just meowing at us. 
And his meow, it kills me. It's like nails on chalkboards. And we're looking at him, we're like, are you serious? Right? Are you serious? Dude, the food is right there. Use your aqal. Use your mind. Come on. We even had the kids. The kids are going, like, cheering him on, like, the end of a marathon. Come on, go, go, right? Like, handing cups of water, like, go, go. And he's just looking at us like, no, I want my food here. Why? Because the nafs is like an untrained animal. When it's used to something, it's used to something. And that's why the idea that Ustad al Fatima finished on, which is like, well, I'm just going to do this, and it's just for me, and the famous line, I can stop when I want to. It's not about wanting to or not wanting to. It's about what your nafs is used to. Right? That's why there are some people who wake up for Fajr with no alarm. How? How is that possible? You're in such deep sleep. Because they have nafs al mutma'inna, they have nafs al lawama, they have the nafs that's been trained with virtue. So that way, when there's an opportunity for good, it runs towards it. But the nafs, nafs al lamarab is suit, the nafs that commands us to evil, that's the one that we struggle with. And it's ups and downs. Some days are better than others, right? But that's the, that's the crux of your existence. You have this canvas in you called the nafs. How are you going to paint it? Is it going to be beautiful or is it going to be ugly? What's it going to look like at the end of your life? That's pretty much it. It's crazy. So your choices that you make, the strokes that you paint with this brush on your nafs, are the result of three things. Number one, we already mentioned, is your aql, your intellect. Allah Ta'ala, he describes people who make bad decisions. He says, they don't know. A lot of them, they don't realize. Right? They don't know. And they have no idea. They're not, they're not using their God-given blessing of intellect to figure things out. You guys ever made a mistake and you're like, that was stupid. You guys ever done that before? You made a decision, you were like, that was dumb. Right? Like talking back to your mom. The minute the words have left your lips, you're already convinced that what a moron you are. Because you know there's no good that's coming from this. And if you're right, it's even worse, actually. Right? If you're right, so there's a, there's a point when you're young, you're always wrong. Just accept it, okay? Just say yes. Say no. Okay? You're wrong. When you get older, you're actually kind of right sometimes. Sometimes. When I say something, it's like one out of ten. One out of a hundred, probably. And when you're right, it's actually even worse. My mom was so funny. Recently, we were talking about something, and I'm pretty, she's watching right now, so I'm busted. But I'm pretty sure I was right. And the reason why I know I was right is because she told me, okay, be quiet. <laughs> you know, that's her response. So you have the aql, right? The aql allows you to make good decisions based on risk assessment. Okay, I'm going to do this. Okay, what's the reality? What do I know about this? What's the impact spiritually upon me for this? What does Allah say about this? What does the Messenger say about this? It's, it's informed by knowledge. Okay? The second realm is the jama'a, the social communal aspect. Who are you with? Al-maru ala dini khalilihi. The Prophet ﷺ, the person is, is upon the way of life of their very close friend, their very close companion. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that, you know, your friends are either like blacksmiths or perfume sellers. Even if you don't do what they're doing, you're going to be impacted by that. The word jama'a, Allah Ta'ala constantly in the Qur'an references this plurality that you are with other people. You're not alone, right? You're alone on the Day of Judgment, but here you get to use, it's a group effort, right? On the Day of Judgment, Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي That on that day, you're all going to be running away from everybody. Right, brothers are here together, Multaf and Azmir. You roll together here now on the day of judgment, you're gone. Safi and I, brothers in law, right? We're gone. We don't even know each other on that day. Children and parents, kids are gonna be begging, Mom, please help me. I can't. I'm sorry. Nafsi nafsi, it's just about me today. The only one that will help you be who? The Prophet. Right? And that's why you love him more than anybody, because he's the one who's gonna be there for you the day nobody else will. So the social impact, Allah blessed us with relationships in this life to help us on the, on, on, on the day where you have no relationships. It's just you. So pick your friends wisely. Be a good friend and be around good friends. Right? You can't be a bad friend and be around good people. You have to be a good person and you will all 
automatically your goodness will start to attract the beauty in everybody. But if I fall short, then whatever my deficiency is, is going to attract deficiencies in other people. We're magnetic creatures, right? We attract. The third is the spiritual or the inner, the nafs. And there's three kinds that we mentioned. Number one, a mod of a suit, the one that tells you to do something wrong. Number two, a lawama. That's the one that is, is called the self-reproaching. That's the one that corrects you. And how many of you have had that before? I want to do this. No, don't do it. I want to, though. No, don't. I want to. No, don't. Right? It's like those nights where I have dinner with friends, and then I come home, and there's dinner at home. And I'm like, hey, you know, you have dinner. You have it again, and there's dessert. And you're like, Allah loves witter, right? We got to keep things odd. Can't just have two meals, right? Like, you know, like, you you know that it's not a good decision, but you're nafs. Amar Basu just commands you to do the wrong thing. But nafs al is the one that along the way, kind of every stop of the way is like, don't do it, don't do it. I like to call it like the siren of the heart, right? And the stronger one's faith, the louder that siren. You can't sleep through it. You can't ignore it. But the weaker one's faith, the more dull that siren is. You can barely hear it until eventually there's no noise. It's just maybe a flashing light and then eventually it's nothing. Eventually, it's like that, that, that alarm, that change battery light on your smoke detector that you haven't looked at in two years, right? I see a couple people laughing. You're living in a very dangerous situation, right? I need to change your batteries, right? Okay. So the choices that we make are from those three realms, our intellect, our social, and our spiritual. The first two are massive in their impact. There's no doubt. What you know, who you're around, that can change everything. I mean, some of us in here right now are... You know, I could say very confidently that I am who I am because of the people who Allah put in my life, right? I'm nothing without Sheikh Abdel Nasser. I'm nothing without my friends from college. I'm nothing, first and foremost, my family, right? goes without saying, but my people in college who pulled me from the depths of stupidity and of, and of ignorance and arrogance and literally came and picked me up from parties that I was at and took me to the masjid, literally. Like, without exaggeration, I can name them to you. I can tell you the car they were driving, red Toyota Corolla, right? Having that in your life, invaluable. Huge impacts, but there's an even greater one. And that is the, the organ or the thing that's inside of you. Of the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَةً إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ that there is a piece, a, a little morsel, like a piece inside of each person. And he says that if that thing is, is good, everything else will be fine. And if it's rotten, if it's corrupt, everything else will be corrupt. Doesn't matter how hard you're, doesn't matter how good you are with people, doesn't matter how smart you are. If this piece is gone, everything else is gone. It's the heart. It's very tricky, man. It's very tricky, subhanAllah, because no one can see it. No one can tell you. No one can look at your external and say, okay, yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, you got some work to do. Okay, you, yeah, I don't know about you, right? No one can do that. The only one who can do that is you. The only one who can ask yourself or confirm, is my heart good or bad, is you. It's, it's really hard to be honest with yourself. Right? But there is a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us some, some help, some tips about how we can know by our actions. Because you can't just open up your heart, right? You can't just look inside. You can't just see it. There's no exam that you take, right? But you can look at your trends, it's like following stocks, which I don't, I don't do, but I have friends who do, right? And you can follow the trends and you can kind of see, okay, this is how things are going, Right? How are my prayers? Am I praying? Am I praying? That's number one. Do I believe that prayer is even like important? Important enough to try? Do I get one? Do I get one, maybe two, maybe three, four or five, inshallah? How am I treating the people around me? What's my relationship like with Quran? Do I ever even listen to it? That's the one problem with this room is that everything echoes. Like a cricket could fart in the corner and it's like, boom, it sounds like an atomic bomb. Just like, you know. So 
That's number one. Number two, what's my status with the Quran? How's my relationship with the Quran? Do I ever listen to it? Or am I, is, is, you know, is music the only thing? And by the way, Spotify has some pretty amazing reciters. I'm not joking. I get embarrassed. People are like, where are you listening to that reciter? Where can I find them? Like Spotify. They're like, why do you have a Spotify account? I'm like, don't ask if you don't want to know. You know, like, do, what's my level with that? What's my level with the Prophet ﷺ? Do I know more about XYZ celebrity than I know about my messenger? These are all questions that you can ask yourself. But Allah Ta'ala also gave us an ayah that I want to share with you guys tonight and we'll conclude inshallah. How do you know you're making good choices? It's all about what you prioritize. You know, one of my teachers told me, he's not really like a Muslim, like he's not really an Islamic studies teacher, he's more like a life teacher. He says something really cool. He said, what you value is where you put your time. And one of my professors in college, she straight up owned me one day when I was always late to her class. It was like a weird time, like 8, 20. It was like such an odd time. And I was always late. I have a really, I'm a really sincere person in terms of trying to make it on time. I really want to. I really want to make it on time. I promise you I want to. But the problem is, it's not my fault. Whenever anyone says that, it's definitely going to be their fault. The problem is that I always underestimate how long it takes to get somewhere. So I'm like driving and I'm like, it's only take five minutes. 30 minutes? Why is it even 30 minutes? Now, sometimes there's traffic, sometimes whatever. But at the end of the day, it's just poor planning. So I was late to this class. This poor profile, I was late probably... It was a Tuesday, Thursday class. I was late probably probably half the semester, okay? And I was good in the class. It was writing, so I was fine. But it was like attendance was a huge part of the grade. I don't know why. That's It's pretty dumb when they make attendance part. Anyways, so at the end of the semester, what do I do? I go up to her and I'm like, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I really, really enjoyed your class. You're so funny. You're so funny, right? And I was like, I really enjoyed it. I'm really sorry that I was late a few times. And I tried to explain why. And she was really nice. She kind of like smiled the whole time. She's like, yeah, yeah. And I thought I was going to get through. I really thought I had something. I was like, I got this. You know, when you, you know when you know you've tricked like a teacher? You're like, I got it. And then she goes, oh, she listened to the whole thing. And at the end, she goes, um, I'm sorry. I can't. I, I want, I, I'd love to, but I can't change your grade. Like your attendance grade is what it is. And I was like, yeah, but I, I just gave you all the excuses. I just told you that, you know, it was because of this and because I share a car, which is true. I share a car with my brother and I have to drop them off first and then do this and a ton. And she said, um, she's like, Mr. Murphy. I said, yeah, she goes, everyone has something. If I asked everyone in class, what's your excuse? I'm sure everyone could tell me something. But there was only a few of you that didn't make it on time. And so she's like, you'll, you'll make it if you, if you care about it. And really, subhanAllah, man, this woman wasn't even a Muslima. And she taught me such a very valuable lesson about my faith. When it comes to your salah, you'll make it if you, if you care about it. When it comes to your faith, you'll do it if you care, if you care about it. So what does Allah Ta'ala tell us? He uses the word irada. Man kana yuridu, whoever intensely desires, deeply wants something. All right, S sets an alarm for six in the morning to order the iPhone first. You know, tries to get every sneaker drop they can, even though they keep getting L's. You know, waiting for PS5 pre-orders. Like waiting, you know what I mean? Whoever deeply desires harf al-akhira, to that level, you want the harvest. Interesting word, harf, because it's like, there's so many things that are tied into that. You want to harvest from the akhirah? Nazid lahu. Allah Ta'ala says, we'll give you more. We'll give you so much, you won't even realize how much you have. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ حَرْثَ الدُّنْيَا نُؤْتِيهِ مِنْهَا Whoever wants from this life, they'll get some from it. Minha doesn't mean you won't get all of it, right? Which is kind of tricky because the dunya, you always want all of it. He says, نُؤْتِيهِ مِنْهَا We'll give them from it. But they will have given up their share of the next life. It's interesting. So number one is priority. Every choice we make, it's either for here or for there. This dunya or the akhira. Every choice we make. I, I, I know it sounds really too simple, but that's pretty much it, right? 
what am I doing? You know, it's either for here or for there. If it's for there, then Allah says, you're going to get so much, you won't even know what to do with it. He says, we'll provide for you in places you never thought possible. You never imagined. But if you want it here, if you want good here, you'll get it, but just don't expect anything on the other side. Okay? And there's a couple characteristics that Allah Ta'ala here in this verse tells us how to do good things. Because it's not that, it's simple to understand, it's hard to do, yes? It's hard to make the right decision. Number one, Allah Ta'ala says is consistency. How consistent are you? It's easy to do something once. There was a narration that I read, I forget where I read it, but he said that a miracle, you know, some people think praying 40 hours in a row would be a miracle. Like, oh, I'm going to pray 40 hours of salah. Some of you are all like, yeah, that's Ramadan, man. So I we have 40 hours. That's not 40, my friend. That's like two. All right. 40 hours. I'm like, that's miraculous. Oh, my goodness. He stood up. She stood up for 40 hours and prayed. And the narration or the statement, it wasn't a narration. It was a statement of a scholar. He said, praying on time, five daily prayers for 40 years. With no sunnah, no nothing, and your prayers are a few minutes long each. Fajr is four minutes, Dhuhr is five minutes, Asr five minutes, Maghrib three, four minutes, Ashat five minutes. He said that's more of a miracle than praying for 40 hours in a row. Praying on time for 40 years. There was a person who didn't miss the single takbir of the salah for 40 years in the masjid. And they said this person must be like a, a, a this person must be a saint. Can you imagine? People try to do so much for the sake of trying to be pious or if just praying on time for 40 years was it. All right, such a simple task, but so difficult because why? Consistency. The entire five daily prayers every day takes a few minutes. Each one takes a few minutes. But consistency is what's tough. Number two, Allah Ta'ala uses the word harf, which means to harvest something. What do you harvest, guys? What do you harvest? Yeah, crops, plants, fruits and vegetables. And how does that process go? Is it fast or slow? It's super slow. It's ridiculously slow. And there's a long portion of it which is completely unseen. You know where this is going, right? When you do good deeds, you have to be, get used to doing it and not being recognized for it. In the era of filming everything we do, in the era of showing everyone what we're doing, in the era of sharing everything, how much do we do that nobody knows about? See, we are really good with that with our sins. With the mistakes we make, we're like perfect. No one knows. But Omar al Khattab, he said something really powerful. He said, you should hide your good deeds just with the same, with the same effort that you hide your sins. There was a guy I met who went to Yale Medical School and I asked him, you know, what do you do for, for, li for a living? Before I knew he was a doctor. And he said, oh, I work in healthcare. I, I said, okay. He was, yeah, I work at a hospital. He was making it sound like he was like the cafeteria guy. I was like, what do you do there? He's like, I work in healthcare. I'm like, what do you do? Do you see patients? He's like, yeah, I do some clinical stuff. Are you a doctor? Yes. Why did you say I'm a doctor, man? Like, you just added like, because he's just so humble. And then I was like, okay, so like, where do you do your training? He's like, uh, in America. Duh, okay, where, I'm asking where? Uh, somewhere on the East Coast. Where on the East Coast? Florida? Maine? Where? He's like, uh, somewhere in the Northeast. I'm like, I'm starting naming, well, I'm not joking, this is how the conversation went. He must have felt really awkward, but I'm just that kind of person. I was like, where? He's like, Connecticut. I was like, did you go to Yale? He's like, yeah. Why don't you say Yale? It took seven minutes, dude. Like, because he's just so humble. He's just so humble. Someone that Safi knows, actually that we both know, I ran into him at a Target, and I was like, where are you going to school, man? He's going to go somewhere northeast. I found out later it's Harvard. I'm like, who does that? What kind of person actively hides the good things? Just like we would all actively hide the embarrassing things, right? Powerful. Because you, why? Because when you have a close friend, you just want to keep it between you and them. So if you and Allah are close, you want to have some things that are just between you two. You don't want anyone else to know. Right, so that's number two. How the farmer, when they plant, when they when they put the the seed or the the root into the ground, it's unseen for so long. And then what blossoms from that when it's down in the dirt? It blossoms. What the crops it takes a lot of patience, though. You got to wait. So that's number three. 
So number one, to be virtuous is you have to be consistent. Don't just do good deeds once and give up. Oh, it's not working. I prayed and Allah told me that he would, you know, if I prayed, he would answer me. You know, there's a hadith that says that Allah will answer the prayer of a person as long as they don't say, I prayed, where is it? Everyone's like, dang, seriously? The hadith says Allah will answer the dua of a person except for the one who says, I made dua, where is my answer? Because why? It was shown from that statement that the person never really cared in the first place. Treating Allah like a waiter. I ordered my food, where is it? Instead of like a friend. Right? Someone that you trusted. Someone that you relied upon. I trust in Allah. If you trust in Allah, trust in his timing. I ask him, I'm going to wait. So be consistent in that. Some scholars say, I prayed and made dua for the same thing for eight, nine, ten years until I got it. That's consistency. That's powerful. Number two, be sincere about it. Don't show it off. Keep it between you and Allah. Because the minute people disappear, your good deeds will disappear too. If you only pray for your parents, guess what happens when you move out? Guess what happens? Prayer is gone too. If you only do good deeds and your friends are around, guess what happens when you're alone? You're not doing those good deeds. So you have to work on having a portfolio of good things that are just for you. You see how loud it is? It's super loud. It's okay. And the third thing is what? Is that after that long while, you have to have patience and you'll eventually harvest the beautiful fruit that you've planted. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us this and more, to allow us to know that we're making good choices, good decisions. And to give us the ability, especially at this age, O oh Allah, I ask you, O oh Allah, especially at this age, the age of being in college and university setting, to be able to have our hearts be purified to make the right choices. I mean, it's a very difficult age, very difficult time to make good choices, but the choices you make now, you'll be very happy that you did. God help guide us. I mean, no, but I mean, everybody. Inshallah, I'll hand it over now to Safi, and we'll do some questions if you guys have any, inshallah. Inshallah. So um, if anybody has any questions, uh, this would be the time, inshallah. We're going to definitely uh, allot at least five to ten minutes for anyone who has any sort of questions generally. Um, anyone? Yes, what's up? Go ahead. Uh, so, so you mentioned about how we should try to pressure the year after we need to strike, but here we're not trying to pressure the year after we're also committed to trying to really care. Mm. Yeah, really good. Really good. And I'll, I'll let all of us kind of chime in on that, you know, Father and myself. The one thing I would say is, you know, the famous hadith that actions are by their intentions. It's probably on some hipster Muslim t shirt company somewhere. Uh, that was another joke. So actions are in the Amal of right? Um, so the, the, the one thing I'll say is that all of our actions, the intention is the common thing between every action we do, whether it's work or whether it's prayer, whether it's sleeping or whether it's waking up for fedr, whether it's eating or fasting, there's always an intention. And I know this sounds way too easy, but quite literally the answer is you're doing something that seems like there's really no benefit for your akhirah. But if you think creatively and hard enough, and honestly, it should come to you in probably 10 seconds. There's always a connection to the next life. Think about the dua that you make for eating. What dua do you make for eating, guys? What dua should you make? The short one's Bismillah. Everyone's like, Bismillah? It's like, yes. But there's a little bit longer one. Do you guys know it? Allahumma barik lana fima razaqtana wa qina adab nar Beautiful, right? Allahumma barik lana, oh Allah, bless for us. Fima razaqtana, and what you have given us. I know all y'all laugh in the movies when they're like, let's pray. <laughs> it's like, we do that too. Don't, don't fall into the trap of laughing at spirituality. Right? We may be different, but we don't laugh at it. Right? We're just, I don't know, it's different. Right? We don't worship Jesus, but it's kind of cool that people pray before they eat. Take a minute, realize where it came from. There's a reason Allah uses crops in the Quran so much. Right? Allah literally says in the Quran, let people look at their food. Why? Because food is an evidence that you don't control things. You don't control things. It came from what? 
It came from the rain, which you don't control. The rain that came down that allowed the earth to be fertilized and allowed the crops to grow and the animals to eat from that grass that you could then eat them and the vegetables and the fruit. That's all from Allah. So you're eating and you're about to go in on a delicious meal and which one of us stops and makes that dua? It takes 10 seconds. And then after you're done, Praise be to the one who fed us and gave us drink and made us Muslims. Right? So in the first one, you're saying, Oh Allah, bless this meal and save us from the fire. And then in the last, in the, on the after side, you're saying, Thank you for this meal and thank you for making me Muslim so I can remember where this meal even came from. Eating just went from being something you do for gains, bro, to something you do for Allah. It's that simple, right? Going to work, putting on clothes. There's literally du'as for everything. So if a person wants to learn, okay, how can I make my day more spiritually active? There are, you know, du'as for that. So how do you, how do you differentiate between the two? You set your intention with those reminders, inshallah. So if you want to share? Um, there was a really, one of the most, my one of my favorite narrations from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu is actually this narration from when he was on his miraculous night journey. Um, and Jibreel Aizam gave him like this tour of heaven. Um, and that's just like an incredible abstract narration just to begin with, right? Just like kind of witnessing somebody tour Jannah and see Jahannam from a distance, like the reality of it all. And so one time the Prophet was passing by and he asked Jibreel Mahad, what's this? And he saw a bunch of people who literally, when they were, they were, it was almost like really, you have to like vividly imagine this. These people were literally planting a seed. And as soon as they planted the seed on the ground, the seed sprout immediately and became like this plant. And immediately the plant grew into like this beautiful tree and the tree immediately grew fruits and the people were eating from those fruits. And the Prophet he asked him, what is that? That's incredible. It's something you don't even see and you, anywhere in this world, even if you wanted to. And Jibreel Ali Islam, he says, well, those are the people that whatever resource that they had in this life, whatever money they made, whatever time they had, whatever energy they expended, they did something to be done. Um, and, and I think that's incredibly beautiful. That, you know, it's almost like remember your roots, right? Uh, like, remember, like, where, like, remember why you have what you have, right? I think a lot of times we forget where we came from. You know, I always remember this whenever I think of stories of my family when we were younger. I still, well, I still remember every day when my mom and my dad moved to the U.S. I remember I used to like, imagine this, I used to be like on the bus going home from school when I was in like second grade. And I used to see my mom walking to Walgreens. That was where she worked. That's where she worked. And after, the, after years of like, you know, making dua and praying and staying sincere to Allah, she has a very beautiful job that she really loves. But one thing my mother and I always talked about personally from son and from mother and son, she said, I will always give back because I knew where we all came from. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, doing things like giving and doing things like remembering and reflecting is probably one of the most beautiful things that a person can do. It's an easy way to beautify the, the mundane deeds like some other friends kind of mentioned. It, it doesn't have to be like, you know, immediately worshiping. You know, Imam Sahib actually talks about this a lot. Ibadah is not just salah, siyam, zakah, hajj. That's not what ibadah is all, always. Ibadah can be just walking down the street and remembering Allah for something random, right? So those are small, beautiful kind of thoughts that, that, that I think will prove really virtuous for us moving forward. Yeah. Interesting, your next question. It's crazy. So, um, one thing that I really wanted to share is kind of going back to intent, the, the reality of intention behind um, everything. And also, you know, the story of Karun comes to my mind because Karun, you know, he is um, basically, he was a part of Ben Israel, he had a lot of money, all this stuff. And the thing with him was that he was very arrogant about his risk 
right? So he was like, basically they asked him like, where did you get this? And he's like, it came from my own knowledge, it came from my own doing, it came from this, it came from that. And the advice that the people who, and literally Allah SWT classifies these people as the people who they wanted the life to hear after. Right, these people, they strive and they work so hard in this dunya for the hereafter. And so this is how they're classified. And the advice that they give him is that they say to him, you know what, you can strive and, and you can you know, take part in the dunya, but the whole point is you don't forget about the akhirah. That when it becomes problematic, is when you're constantly going out and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna work, I wanna make this much money, I'm doing this, doing that, to set up your beautiful world here, but you have no intention of like thinking about, okay, when I die, what will happen? That you don't, you're not thinking about ever giving, from there, you're not thinking about ever giving to charity, you're not thinking about you know ever being kind to somebody, you're not thinking about so many other things that are far beyond just the now. And so that's something to keep in mind that at the end of the day, it is a part of us being people to live in this world. You know, saying like, oh, I don't want to any part of doing here, so I'm just gonna not make any money. It doesn't really fly, because what are you gonna do? Like, run off with somebody? I don't know, like that's also not right. So I, I was trying to put that in the nicest way possible. That's the best word I could think of. Um, so it's so important to recognize that part of that is that's why Allah SWT says, uh, that they spend from what we have given them. Like it's a part of, of you existing in this world to go out and pursue these things and get this. But keep in mind the Akhirah. Because keeping in mind the Akhirah, keeping in mind that you have to stand before Allah gives you the parameters and the boundaries in what you're pursuing. Any other questions? Ladies? No? All right, we'll, we'll wrap up because it is 846. So we do have food, right? Yeah. Okay. We got pizza for everybody, inshallah. So the way that we do food, um, these, go ahead, yeah, you can grab your phones. So I'm going to Instagram. So the way in which we, uh, we do food for the temporary space, we don't eat inside. Just because we're not uh, we're not there yet, we'll figure out a system inshallah where maybe once it gets super cold and we have to, we will. But for now, there's a really nice patio outside, um, and so because we should be keeping our masks on or have giant plexiglass things in front of us uh, indoors, we're just going to eat outside inshallah. So you guys can go to the uh, where's the food located? It's right out there. It's right out there. So you can grab it on the way out inshallah, and you guys can feel free to chill in the patio area inshallah. Okay, barakallahu feekum, guys, and we'll see everyone here next Thursday inshallah.